Today's video is kindly sponsored by Babbel. Babbel is a language learning app which provides award-winning courses in languages such as French, Spanish, Italian, German, Dutch and many more. With 2022 just around the corner, why not set a goal of studying a language? A goal of mine is to become fluent in another language and I am continuing to study both Spanish and Italian on the app. Perché non ti unisci a me? Having Babbel as part of my daily routine has helped enormously in retaining vocabulary and grammar and there are lots of great activities available in reading, writing, listening and speaking. As well as having achieved a certificate in both Spanish and Italian at university, thanks to Babbel, I have made connections to family over in the US who speak Spanish and I have utilised what I've learned on Babbel to communicate with them. I definitely feel much more confident in my abilities and that is all thanks to Babbel. I've also discovered that I'm able to keep disciplined in terms of practising every single day to keep what I learn fresh in my mind. Unlike several other language learning apps on the market, the content has been made by genuine speakers of the languages and don't work by an algorithm or computer generated material. The content is also enormously useful as it prepares the learner for real life situations. Another fantastic aspect of Babbel is that there are no adverts and you can participate in lessons offline too. Doing just 15 minutes of Babbel a day will have you speaking a new language in just a few weeks and further your learning with Babbel's upgrades to the app, such as short stories, culture clips, a podcast and Babbel Live, where you can add live classes to your existing subscription for an additional fee or just subscribe to them as a standalone product. Head to the link in the description to get 65% off Babbel with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Thank you once again to Babbel for sponsoring this video. Jennifer Renee Odom was born on the 25th of August 1980. She was raised by mother Renee and stepfather Clark Converse alongside her younger sister Jessica. The Odoms lived on a 15-acre property in St Joseph, a small community west of Dade City, Pasco County, Florida. The rural neighbourhood where the family settled was dotted with several orange groves and occupied mostly by extended family. It was a huge playground for Jennifer and Jessica, who were, according to their mother, as much friends as they were sisters. Together they built forts, rode four-wheelers and spent summer days swimming in the creek behind their house. Brown-eyed Jennifer was a very active child who adored barefoot water skiing. The bright and bubbly 7th grader was once rated the 7th best in the country for her age, succeeding in various competitions. Jennifer also enjoyed archery and participated in all sorts of activities, including playing the clarinet. Three days before she disappeared, Jennifer marched with Thomas E. Waitman Middle School Band. Aside from her various hobbies and interests, Jennifer adored animals and loved the family pets, a rabbit called Beanie and a spaniel called Gypsy. On the 19th of February 1993, the Odin family's world would be turned upside down, never to be the same again. Renee Converse, Jennifer's mother, stated that that morning dawned crisp but not quite cold. Jennifer had school and followed her usual morning routine. Jennifer got dressed in jeans and a turtleneck, both white. She pulled a red cashmere sweater, a gift from her grandmother, over her shoulder-length chestnut hair. Then she laced up a pair of black boots and got into the car with her mother. The two drove 200 yards up the winding Lime Rock driveway to wait for the school bus near their mailbox at the intersection of Jessamine and Jim Denny roads. It was a weekday morning ritual that gave them time to talk. On that day, Renee and Jennifer, who was an honour roll student, discussed mathematics. When the bus came, Jennifer climbed aboard and took her usual spot on the back seat. 
That way, she and her mother could see each other until their roots diverged when Renée turned left and headed to work. Little did Renée know that this would be the very last time she would see her firstborn daughter alive. Jennifer and her younger sister, Jessica, usually arrived home from school on two different buses, Jennifer usually arriving home first at around 3pm. On this particular day, in mid-February 1993, young Jessica arrived home at around 4pm and approached the front door only to realise that the door was locked. Her first thought was that Jennifer was playing a joke on her as they had done so on each other in the past. However, as time passed and Jennifer was nowhere to be seen, nine-year-old Jessica went to her grandmother's house to collect the key. Upon her arrival, Jessica realised that her sister wasn't there either. This was when a concerned Jessica decided to call her mother. The girl's parents, Clark and Renee, returned from work and upon arrival, a panicked Renee phoned Jennifer's best friend, Michelle, who told her that she had seen Jennifer get off the bus that afternoon a mere 200 yards from the family home. Something must have happened to Jennifer within that short distance. This was when the Odin parents called authorities. Over the following days, Clark and Renee joined police, friends, neighbours and volunteers in the search for their missing 12-year-old daughter, scouring horse farms and orange groves. Unfortunately, in the early hours of the 25th of February 1993, six days after she disappeared, detectives located Jennifer's body, about 600 feet off Powell Road, naked, face down and severely decomposed in a Hernando County orange grove, around 10 miles from the family home. Jennifer was identified through fingerprints, but also through jewellery two rings, a gold chain with a half-heart charm that said best friends on it. Understandably, her parents were too distraught to identify her body. The medical examiner ruled Jennifer's death a homicide caused by blunt force trauma to the head. Detectives said she likely died there in the woods, not long after her abduction. However, it hasn't ever been revealed to the public what was Jennifer's cause of death. Detectives did all they could to find out what happened to Jennifer, looking at similar killings for clues, stopping hundreds of blue trucks across the country, putting up billboards and even offered cash rewards for information leading to identifying the 12-year-old's killer. However, all led to dead ends. Detectives' biggest break came in January of 1995, when a couple who were out hunting for scrap metal found a black clarinet case and a backpack in a thicket behind Oak Hill Hospital in Spring Hill. They opened a textbook inside the backpack. Jennifer Odom was scribbled on the inside front cover. Interestingly, fingerprints on the items did not match the couple who discovered the items, Jennifer or her family members, and the prints didn't match any on record. Jennifer's white pants, red sweater, black boots, brown purse and white Hooters zip-up jacket are still missing to this day. Investigators did believe, however, that the way these items were concealed in the woods suggested that the killer was local and familiar with the back roads and rural areas where things could be hidden. Suspects in the case came and went, but none came to any fruition. Convicted rapist and kidnapper Jeffrey Norman Croom Sr. was named a person of interest in Jennifer's murder. Familial DNA testing through his son connected Crum Sr. to kidnapping, sexual assault and attempted murder that occurred in January 1992 in nearby Pasco County. In April 2017, he was arrested and charged in that case. Authorities noted similarities between the 1992 case and Jennifer's murder. Both victims were teenage girls, abducted after getting off the school bus, taken to a remote field, raped and left for dead. New testing is currently underway on evidence from Jennifer's case. However, Crum Sr. has not yet been charged in her murder. In June 2013, word began to circulate about a possible break in the case. 
Authorities, along with agents from the FBI, converged on a two-storey home located at 12714 Pompanic Street in San Antonio, Florida. The search led investigators to the waters of Lake Juvita, which is located directly behind the home. The Pasco County Sheriff's Office would only say that they were searching the lake, which is located only four miles from where Jennifer was abducted for a vehicle. No other information on the search has ever been made public. The home by the lake is owned by Al Kiefer, who was 46 at the time of Jennifer's murder. Kiefer, a member of a prominent Dade City family that ran a downtown pharmacy and other businesses, has been questioned in the case, but again, this has come to nothing. Other than the evidence found in the woods, the only clue investigators had was one given by students on the bus. A faded blue pickup was parked at the stop when Jennifer got off alone. This could be the vital clue in Jennifer's case and, should the vehicle be found, could lead to identifying her killer. Since the investigation began, authorities have collected nearly 1,000 pieces of evidence, taken thousands of tips, done hundreds of interviews and clocked tens of thousands of hours building a case file 75,000 pages thick. They've questioned nearly 100 people of interest and as of latest 2013, Hernando County assigned a deputy full-time to Jennifer's case, Detective Jim Boylan. Despite all of this, Jennifer's case remains unsolved. Outside of the Odom home, under a massive oak tree, stands a post that still bears four names. Clark, Renee, Jennifer, Jessica. Nearby is a magnolia tree that Renee was given the week her daughter disappeared, but despite the time that has passed, Renee's grief remains strong. She thinks of her daughter daily. What she would be like now. Would she have had children? Had she gotten her chance at life, what would she have done with it? Jennifer Odom is buried at Sacred Heart Cemetery in Dade City, not far from where she lived. Her murder shook the entire community to the core. Many parents never allowed their children on a school bus again. Some even refused to let them walk home alone, fearful of a killer living amongst them. As of December 2021, Jennifer's case remains open.